Hey, how have you been? Welcome back to my channel. It's Emma and today I'm gonna talk about all of the books I read in July. I read a lot of five-star books in July, which is so unusual for me. I just finally feel like I'm finally getting into books that I know I'll love. I feel like I'm finding the genres that I love. I feel like I found my place within the world of literature where I know I'm gonna find books that I love, which is something I would like to construct a whole video about and talk about how my reading tastes have changed and how I find books that I know I'm gonna love and what my favorite genres really, really are now because it's so interesting that it has changed so drastically in what appears to be a very short amount of time. But that being said, I have a lot of books to talk about. As per usual, I'm just gonna start with my favorites because I don't wanna waste your time talking about mediocre books when we could just get to the good stuff right away. My favorite book of the month was Autobiography of Red by Anne Carson. <sighs> yeah. I feel like I don't, nothing I'm gonna say, first of all, is going to equal anything that this book will give you or that this book will say for itself. Um, I was blown away. It's so insane to me to think that I exist as a human alongside other humans who are able to articulate these thoughts, write down this language that has literally never been used before, continually make something new and unique and mind-blowing. Anne Carson is a gosh darn genius. Um, this was phenomenal. So Autobiography of Red is a novel in verse. There is so much to say about this book. Someone could write their PhD on this and do a different element of this book every single year for like 25 years for their PhD. Like it was insane. The amount of, like I just felt too stupid to read and understand and properly appreciate this book, but it still like tore my world apart. So it is called a novel in verse and just on that front, on this whole genre, it's an autobiography. Whose autobiography? Who's telling it? Whose novel is it? Who's writing the poetry? There are autobiographies within autobiographies. There are people dying, our narrator, our that person who's talking dies multiple times. Autobiography of Red is a retelling, a reworking of Heracles' 10th labor, uh, also a reformation of Stesichorus's Geryonysis, which is the telling of Heracles' 10th labor in that Heracles has to kill this red-winged monster named Geryon and take all of his red cattle. Anne Carson kind of figures and formats this as a coming-of-age story set in the present uh, where Heracles and Geryon exist in our world today. I love the aspect of mythology breaking through into the real world and this kind of typological type of person, I guess, this stereotype, this mythological being, being someone that we could recognize today, which appears all the time. Another thing I have to talk about right away is Anne Carson's language. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Like, it is just... I, I just wish language could exist like it does in this book for me every single second of every single day because what she does with it, the way that she uses language, what she writes, this releasing of being that she talks about a little bit in the preface, which I've mentioned before, is just... It feels like you're suddenly breathing something other than oxygen. I also have to thank Ren from Rebel Reads for uh, gifting me and sending me this book uh, because it was, this is one of the most important books and most beautiful books and best put together books I've ever read or seen in my whole entire life. It is a novel, it is an autobiography about love and heartbreak and growing up and violence um, and relationships and geography and Gertrude Stein and Greek mythology and every single thing ever. It is so complicated, so beautiful, so intricately woven and I know there's a sequel called Red Dock which I would love to get my hands on. There are just a billion and one things going Going on in this very short book. Um, it's very interesting. We have appendices that come at the beginning of the novel. We have little 
uh, questions and semi-essays and pieces of songs and fragments and poetry. Um, basically to just describe this book, to take a line from the book to describe it, um, it kind of reads as if she has composed a substantial narrative poem, then ripped it to pieces and buried the pieces in a box with some song lyrics and lecture notes and scraps of meat. Yeah, I don't really want to say too much more about it just because I feel like I literally can't. Like if you just go into this book and read it, um, I think it should and will speak and scream for itself. And it's a book that I just want to read immediately again because there's so many things that I know I missed, so many things I didn't pick up on and I can't stop screaming about Anne Carson. Everything uh, she touches turns to gold just beautiful beautiful five stars surprisingly i had another five star read in the book of july the month of july um and i got to listen to this one by an audiobook it is a classic or i guess some people call it a modern classic i don't really care about those distinctions this was just phenomenal 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 it was great guys so this audiobook was actually narrated by the author and that book is beloved by tony morrison um this was crazy. This was so crazy. I was lucky enough to have the physical copy of this book that I found thrifted a few years ago. And if you can see, I made quite a lot of dog-eared notes at the top of the page just while listening along. Um, eventually, I would like to go back and read this a second time over to fully annotate it because that's um, kind of what I like to do is annotate a book when I'm reading it for the second time or um, some other time than the first time, which obviously didn't happen with the autobiography I read. But there was, once again, a trillion and one things going on in Beloved. It is historical fiction. It is horror, literary horror. It is magical realism. Um, and it is uh, exceptional. Toni Morrison's writing, I guess, to start there, chronicles the lives of a whole bunch of different people in this novel. The novel opens up and we are following this woman named Setha who has escaped from slavery. And the novel opens as she is burying her young daughter named Beloved. We find out that Setha has another daughter called Denver and she and Denver live alone in this haunted house because the house is actually haunted by the spirits of Setha's departed daughter, Beloved. This is near the end of the Civil War. Uh, she is trying to carve out this new life for herself and for her daughter, Denver. However, this is very quickly interrupted when a figure from Setha's past named Paul D comes to the house to visit them, see what's going on with them, and essentially kind of rehashes and reopens the past that is never past for them. This is about the effects of slavery through generations of families and wives and daughters and women. It is about the generational effects and the generational trauma that slavery engenders. Um, it's a very hard book to read for sure. It's a very scarring, powerful, affecting book. This is a very, very affecting book. One thing I absolutely like loved about this book and it fits so well with the function that it was trying to perform was Toni Morrison's arranging of this novel and arranging of memories, flashback scenes, the timeline, uh, the non-linear narrative that was employed in here just was like crushing in the effect that it created for the reader uh, and especially for our characters. This like I, I'm not, I don't want to spoil anything, but this huge thing I want to say about this book is something I can't say because I don't want to spoil it. I would recommend this for literally everyone. It is insane. There's ghostly elements. Magical realism, like I mentioned, is used. It, oh, it's just so mind-blowing and Toni Morrison is so talented. I am so interested in reading so many more of her works because I know they are all glowing glistening things of literature and this one was just insanity insanity the way that the past is remembered and crops up and becomes this thing that people are either trying to run away from as hard as they can or embrace and get over and let go of if they can uh, i love books that deal with that and this one was just so unbelievably scary and just 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 so good i don't have any more words for it five stars um five stars five stars i read a lot of unsettling books this month actually uh the next one is no different probably the most unsettling book i've read this month it is a horror psychological thriller 
ghost story or is it is it a ghost story i guess you can decide uh and that is we have always lived in the castle by shirley jackson i feel like i'm matching the cover uh this was my first shirley jackson book as well and i loved it probably four and a half stars maybe 4.75 stars this was crazy once again a very short unsettling book there's so much uneasiness in how brief this book appears to be. So this book opens up, we're following two sisters, Mary Katz Blackwood and her sister Constance, who live alone in the Blackwood mansion on top of a hill overlooking a village full of villagers who despise them, who hate them, and we're not really sure why. They also live with their decrepit uncle Julian, who is quickly descending the slippery slope of old age and maybe arsenic poisoning, and they also have a cat called Jonas, whom Mary Cat converses with uh, quite often. This book dealt with some really, really bad, heavy, huge topics of anxiety, specifically through the lens of agoraphobia and extreme shyness, I suppose. Uh, a lot of lot a lot a lot of other issues as well which is so unsettling so hard to read uh, especially in this climate as well i found it was very affecting to that degree and extent this is a pseudo murder mystery it's a a plot that i don't want to tell you anything about i think the best way for me to talk with you guys about this book is to tell you a little bit about our two sisters our uh blackwood sisters so mary cat uh is her name <laughs> is her nickname her full name is mary catherine let's talk about her for a little second. She lists one of her favorite things as being the death cup mushroom. She knows the Latin names of many, many varieties of poisonous plants and mushrooms alike. She likes to bury things. She likes to bury things in the backyard, in the woods, in the forest, away from the town. She is obsessed with this one particular Shakespeare play. She is not allowed to touch knives, she is not allowed to prepare food. She breaks things on purpose, very occasionally. She likes to smash pitchers and glass vases on the ground, and she loves her sister Constance above all else and very dearly. Constance, on the other hand, is basically baking for the whole duration of this book, either baking or cooking or working away hard in the kitchen to feed her sister and her dying uncle. Uh, she makes very strange, elaborate desserts and dinners and lunches. She has this huge storage facility in the bottom of the manor full of canned goods, jams, pickled, things um, that have lasted for generations of the Blackwood women, basically, who have all made these canned, preserved things, which is so cool. There's just so many cool elements in this book as well. Once again, maybe it's a ghost story. Maybe it's not a ghost story. Maybe it's not even, what, what, even, what is even real? I don't know. I finished this book and I was just like, what did I just read? What just happened? Such an unsettling, story that Shirley Jackson is obviously just so famous for. I know this book got turned into a movie quite recently and I cannot recommend it highly enough as well. These three books were my favorite books of the month and I'm so excited to get more into the rest of Shirley Jackson's work because I haven't explored it at all. Before moving on into some mediocre books, I just want to say a point that I think I have for most of the mediocre books I read for the rest of the month that really, um, comes in parallel with these two books because both Beloved and We Have Always Lived in the Castle were just excellent, super high, good, great examples of how to tell a story and how to write a novel. The trust that it gives the reader, the information that it withholds from the reader, the suspense, the mystery, um, and just the overall writing in the way that it's so realistic, so secretive, um, and doesn't really let on to too much, just feels very real. Uh, and that's something I really struggled with in the other books I'll mention near the end of this video where I gave mostly two and a half, three stars just because their narrative function was so way too narrative-y, like they tell you every single thing that's going on, they leave nothing to the imagination, they don't make the reader work for absolutely anything, uh, and it was just bad. But these two books, I just wanted to say straight away, they are just so masterful at that, um, so that's something I kind of want to 
balance off of right away is the insanity that these two books provided in their storytelling. So I also got to read A Dark Academia for our Dark Academics book club. This was our book for July and that was If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. This is a dark academia infused and infected <laughs> with Shakespeare, literally. I was really I wasn't really sure what I was going to make of this book uh, and my opinion fluctuated throughout the whole entire novel. At the end though, I did decide to give this four stars. I don't know why I got so invested in the lives of the students that we follow in this book, but I just found myself getting so, so close to them and so um, enraged for them and so preoccupied with what their lives were doing and how the book would turn out and pan out and end ultimately. So uh, we are following a group of, I believe it is, oh my gosh, one thing I will say is that there's too many people in this book. I think six or seven pretty sure it's seven. Uh, students who are all studying at Delacour Classical Observatory, they are fourth year theater students specializing in Shakespeare once again. Uh, obviously we have the dark academia trope of just being over the top, utterly pretentious, full of hubris, full of so much pride and arrogance, uh, and we have this whole straight line of Shakespeare running through, in some cases just chopping people's heads off, invading people's mind spaces, making the characters in this book literally crazy. Uh, some actions in here are definitely a little bit outrageous and not super believable, I just want to say that, but in the end I did give it four stars because once again, I just, I really got attached to the story. I got so attached to the story. Was the writing great? No. It always balanced on like this knife edge point of being way too dang descriptive and metaphorical. One page, I think I marked it, I will show you this. Everything marked on this one page is a simile or a metaphor and then it continues on through this whole chapter of literally almost every paragraph one over-the-top simile is used. Uh, other times though I really liked the description and the scenes uh, and the layout of some uh, parts in this book were just so beautiful, so nice, namely the performances of a lot of Shakespeare plays because the fourth year uh, at Delacour is all focused on Shakespeare's tragedies, which is what um, is the catalyst and what makes this book a tragedy in and of itself is that the plays start performing their tragic elements in real life. So it is a murder mystery. It is a study on Shakespeare. It is dark academia for sure. I enjoyed this so much more than Ninth House. Uh, I think it might be one of my new favorite dark academia books. Something I just want to say is James and Oliver. James and Oliver. Alas, the sea hath cast me on the rock and washed me from shore to shore. I cried. I did cry. I don't cry at books very often. I think, I'm not sure if it was the book itself that made me cry. I think there was a lot going on in my life the week that I finished this book and the book was just the last straw on top and I bawled like a little baby for like an hour. We will of course be having a live show on If We Were Villains on my channel. I'm not sure of the date. It will be in the description box down below, I believe. Uh, I'm so excited to talk with you all about this and finally hear everyone's opinions, both those uh, of my co-hosts and of you guys because I know so many of you read it. This was such um, an asked for book for our book club and I'm so happy I finally got around to reading this. This was also funnily enough gifted to me by Carolyn for Christmas. Thank you once again. She's actually gifted me two of our Dark Academia book club books before we even knew that the Dark Academics book club was a thing which kind of just feels like it was meant to be in the first place. So that was If We Were Villains, four stars. Uh... <laughs> James and Oliver. Okay, we're now going to move into some mediocre books that I read. I have one, two, three, four books that I gave three stars to. Two are sci-fi, one is a thriller, and the other one is a fantasy. So let's just start with the fantasy. I gave three stars to Jade City by Fonda Lee. If I'm being honest, maybe 2.75 stars. This was a mega fantasy, an urban fantasy novel uh, that I really had high hopes for because the synopsis sounded so interesting and I was really hooked for about the first like 200 pages I think but the main pitfall of this novel for me and what you'll probably hear for the rest of the novels that I'll talk about in a second was that it became so boring and specifically so boring because of the way the story was being told. Unfortunately Fonda Lee, this is a narrative choice that a lot of authors make, a lot of people make, a lot of people like it, but I cannot stand when a book's 
voice is just all tell and no show. Um, what I mean by that is basically describing every single aspect of a scene that is going on, explaining every single aspect of why a certain decision or choice is being made. In this case, Jade City is a very politically dense, uh, I believe it's described as like a gangster urban fantasy set in the mythical island, not real island of KCON. Uh, I really enjoyed the concept. Basically, we have these really powerful families who control um, and use Jade, which gives them special powers, basically just boosts their overall human capabilities, I'd like to say. Uh, and then we obviously have warring clans, we have a lot of political drama, there's romance, it's it feels like a very realistically populated place and I love that. I love the idea. But like I said, what ruined it for me was just the storytelling decisions. Like it became so boring. It became so predictable. This book took forever for anything to happen, which is a complaint I'll have for another book too in a second. I just really can't stand and I don't really see any real reason for an author to tell you every single thing about why something is happening, leaving no room for the reader to have any autonomy of their own, to insert themselves at all to guess at anything, to imagine what the life is like in their novel. Um, and unfortunately, Jade City just became really boring in that sense because um, it was just too much. It was too much. There was no room for the reader to exist and to have any interchange or play with the novel. And that was really disappointing for me. But overall, like I said, I really enjoyed the concept. I just wish it had been more more better. <laughs> I just wish it had been uh, carried out in a little bit of a better fashion. So that was Jade City. I'm going to talk about a novel that I had the exact same complaints about because we're just on that tangent, so why not? I felt the exact same way about The Aeronauts Windless by Jim Butcher. This is also an audiobook that was pretty much the same length. They're over 20 hours each, I believe. Um, Jim Butcher's The Aeronauts Windless is a sci-fi fantasy uh, and it is steampunk. One 1,002% steampunk. Something that I also have to say right off the bat probably to warn you is that the Aeronauts Windlass just recycles and reuses every single trope of the steampunk genre. Uh, a little bit like too much. It was insane. It was crazy. That is the main review that I've read from people who have uh, negative critiques about this book is that it is just one trope after another and I have to wholeheartedly agree. This is also a very politically dense um, militarized book I want to say. We have these essentially privateers and military uh, operations going on in the airspace of the spires or the countries and cities that uh, this world inhabits. A good thing that I will definitely uh, praise about this book is that we had a really really huge cast of characters, a whole bunch of interesting people, we had interesting relationships, we had interesting um, concepts going on in here, but once again, like I said, they're all recycled steampunk tropes. Just the exact same problem as Jade City for me was that Jim Butcher basically just tells you everything that's going on. It takes so long for absolutely anything to happen in the Aeronauts Windlass. One fight scene takes like 75 pages of description. Things started to happen in the Aeronauts Windlass in a very circular fashion. We had these weird adventures that wouldn't go anywhere. They would just lead you back to the start and then you'd have to go somewhere else. It just felt like this like really bad D&D &D campaign where the person who is orchestrating it has no idea what they're doing uh, and they just lead you on this very boring, slow moving, heavily descriptive, uh, mediocre adventure. And I was really disappointed because I love, I love, I love I love steampunk, but the Aeronauts win last, which was not it. Both Jade City and Aeronauts, I probably gave 2.7 three stars maybe, but um, I will say the Aeronauts win last was mildly entertaining for a little bit until it just got way too boring. I also gave three stars to Dark Matter by Blake Crouch, which was a sci-fi that I thought was gonna actually be pretty promising. I love sci-fi. I was so interested to read a newer release, I believe, and one that sounded really interesting. Basically, we're following this man named Jason and he has everything he wants. He has this nice paying job as a university professor. He has a beautiful wife, a beautiful son, and he is so happy. Unfortunately, one night he goes out to get drinks with his friend at a bar and as he is coming back home, he gets, first of all, he gets smashed 
by a taxi and then to make matters worse he gets abducted a man in a mask brings him to this abandoned warehouse and jason is frantically asking who the heck are you what do you want with me do you want my money and the guy's like no no it's too crazy you wouldn't believe me if i told you uh so immediately i know who this guy is which was so upsetting like immediately as this sci-fi quantum mechanic they basically tell you they tell you what the element of science is they're dealing with and then you just like literally already know who the, the bad guy is and it's so upsetting because that was basically the whole crux at the heart of this novel i think it's why a lot of people love it so much because um it's it, it can be seen as such a big twist but it just wasn't because the whole time i was like i i know what's going on and it, it just wasn't fun anymore because i knew what the character didn't know and that's not that's not a fun situation at all so basically jason wakes up after being injected with a needle full of something in this world that appears visibly to be his world but it's not his world because in the world he wakes up in he actually never got married never had a son he is a prize winning scientist working on this huge scientific project that I won't say because I don't want to spoil anything. The writing was mediocre, the plot twists were mediocre, the plot twists were actually just bad. I really didn't get anything out of this, I didn't care about the characters, the author tries to make you feel so attached to this guy and so sympathetic for his family and his son and his life. However, I just, I really didn't care, there were no stakes for me, I didn't care what happened to this guy, the ending felt just such a letdown, such a letdown. I did give it a generous three stars, but realistically, another 2.75. So, actually, if anyone has read Recursion by Blake Crouch, which I think is his newer book, actually, um, let me know if it's any better or if it was any good at all, because um, I do love sci-fi. I just didn't get along with Dark Matter, which is sad. So, next book I read was a thriller that I almost DNF'd, like, eight times before finally just deciding to finish it and actually really enjoying it more than I thought I would. And that was You by Carolyn Kepnes. Yeah. First of all, I think if I was physically reading this book myself and not listening along with the audiobook, I would have just put it down after like page three. But I think because the audiobook narrator's performance, I just really, like really, really have to compliment this guy because he like committed 5,000% uh, and the experience of listening to this second person narrative psychological horror not really horror thriller book was actually really unsettling and what made the experience um just better and made me not put it down because it was really uh, creepy and unsettling if you don't know you is now like a pretty popular netflix show where we're following our main character named joe goldberg he works at a bookstore he has a really bad childhood past uh and one day when this girl named guinevere beck walks into the bookshop um they hit it off and we think this encounter is just a nice bookstore encounter obviously we all have dreams of meeting someone who works at a bookstore and falling in love because then they can give us discount prices on books but we quickly find out that joe is this really messed up stalker who starts to stalk beck steals her phone you know the drill what was so interesting for me actually and i thought was really really well done is that like the juxtaposition of Joe alongside every other person in this book made you root for Joe and made you want him to succeed. He became like your favorite character, which you know in your own mind is so messed up and so wrong, but the way that it's told, because obviously it's him talking to Beck for this whole thing in his own inner monologue, was so well done. The way that he arranges a situation, the way that he gaslights the reader is actually insane. The way that he like twists a situation around and then maybe later you find out the situation wasn't actually that way, but it's just how he is perceiving it in his own mind, the way that he interprets people, the way that he thinks about people that Beck interacts with and her friends and family and everyone around her is actually crazy. I love like the commentary about the relationship between Beck and Joe because every time that Beck somehow encounters Joe somewhere, she'll joke about, oh, I hope you don't think I'm a stalker. I hope you don't think I'm following you. I'm sorry if I appear so creepy. When we actually know that Joe is like a legitimate stalker is it was just, it was really good in that sense. Obviously there was so much in this book. First of all, I feel like this book was way too long. You could have cut so much out um, and there were other problems I had with it, but overall I would give it like a legitimate three stars, not like a 2.75 because there were a lot of really cool, well done aspects to this thriller, I think. So that was you. All right, and we're gonna finish the month off with two 
non-fiction books that I read. The first non-fiction book that I read in July was Happiness by Thich Nhat Hanh. This is a little uh, audiobook that I listened to all about uh, mindfulness and mindfulness as the way to happiness or I guess happiness as the way in and of itself which is interesting. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it. It was really great. I love all of Thich Nhat Hanh's work that I read. I've read a lot of his work by now um, and once again I just Love it, love it. The last book that I read in July was called The Lost City of the Monkey God by Douglas Preston. This is a nonfiction all about uh, an ancient city in Honduras called La Ciudad Blanca or the White City uh, and about the very recent search actually and discovery of the city and other ancient ruins in and of themselves lost in the Mesquicha area of Honduras, what is basically an uninhabitable and what has been an untouched geographic location for centuries. I went into this book and I picked it up because I thought it was going to be about the culture and the civilization and the city itself, like the lost city that was discovered. And obviously there's really problematic terms with calling something a lost city. This book did actually deal with a lot of problems of archeology span uh, and attributed a small section of this book to talking about the language that archeology span employs um, and the history of archeology. span So those were the reasons that I went into this book, but it was basically just this journalist, Douglas Preston, because he was actually on the expedition to find the ruins of this lost city. It was basically just his like journal logs. Um, I know he's trying to make it interesting and it was a really interesting told nonfiction, but in the end, this was a mess. Like the way it was arranged, what it decided to encompass in its um, book format was a mess. Like he just went on so many unavoidable tangents that were not necessary at all and like took away from what he was trying to discuss, what his main point was, which obviously should be the white city and Honduras and this discovery. This guy talks about snakes for a decidedly <laughs> long time. I gave it three stars because I did learn some things about it and it was really interesting seeing how technology is used today, specifically like LIDAR, radar, and um, NASA and everything like that to discover these uh, buried places and grown over places and in this case places where the forest has just over canopied and hidden and protected um, places of the world where we haven't tread yet. But on the whole, like I said, this guy actually just went on so many tangents. Like if I handed in an essay and it had as many tangents as this guy went on, I would get so many sassy comments from a professor, like it was bad. I would really be interested in reading like a properly constructed book that solely focused on the city um, and the background and the history, because like I said, it didn't really delve into that, even though I know Douglas Preston is only a journalist and he's not really equipped to educate people on that, but I just thought that's what this book was gonna be about, and it wasn't, and I was wrong. If you want one man's journal talking about his insane fear of snakes for like 12 weeks, this is the book for you. So those are all the books I read in the month of July. Um, yeah, what did you guys read? How are you? How have you been doing? What was your favorite book of the month? You guys know I always like to know that because um, Oh, just, just bring her back for a second. Bring her back for a second. This was so good. Other than that, thank you so much for watching and I will see you so soon in my next video. I love you all so much. Ciao.